He was the master at falling over. I mean, he was brilliant at it. He, I don't know how he did it, and he did it with such style and elan. He would sort of suddenly be standing and then he'd be on the floor. People think that slapstick is something that is maybe slapdash and, and just made up and, and rubbish, but it's not. Norman Wisdom has got it off to a really fine art. Lorne, before I met him, was the most popular film star in this country. I remember going to see a film of his, I got to the cinema and they were lined up right round the block of the whole cinema. There must have been about five or six hundred, maybe even more than that, people lined up four deep to see his latest film. You got my leather! What have I done? The fact he's dauntless, that was the wonderful thing about him, that he could... There he was at the bottom of the whole social pile and he simply didn't recognise this. I'm as good as you lot. What? Oh. Now what? I'll let me cap up there. Tuck it down, will you? Oh, cap. Hey, what time in the morning? I've already told you, 7.30 sharp! Oh. Hey, well, get to say about 7, eh? And keep our fingers! He was the last of the proletarian comedians, really. I think a lot of his comedy comes clearly from uh, a very, very, very difficult childhood. Uh, and I think the way Norman personally dealt with the difficulty of his upbringing was through comedy, but the humiliation that he puts himself through on the stage, the routine with the, the boxing machine and so on. He wrings laughs out of his humiliation and that comes instinctively but very deeply from, from his psyche, I'm sure. My parents were divorced and split up when I was nine and my dear brother was 11. My father was a chauffeur and when mother left home, he was brutal. I can remember being cheeky, a little bit cheeky perhaps sometime, and he picked me up and threw me like that. And I, I hit the ceiling and then came down in the corner. I hit the ceiling. And then he just walked out and left me there. My mother used to come and see myself and my brother at school and you know, after school sometimes, just come and see us. About once a month or something like that. But one Christmas day, she bought me a bicycle. It was a, a fairy cycle. And I went home, I was so delighted with this. Oh, so excited. And my father said, what, what's that? I said, it's a fairy cycle, Dad. He said, where'd you get that? I said, Mum gave it to me. He grabbed it out of my hand and stumped and stumped and stumped, smashed it to bits. <laughs> Unkind. I'd left school, he opened the door, came in, just looked at me and said, out. And he opened the door 
and I went out. And I remember I walked down the steps, just in the front, in front of the door, walked down the steps, and he slammed the door. And I turned around and I said, "I'll never see you again, Dad." And I never did. I mean, shame. I was then sleeping rough around Victoria Station and all around there anywhere. This coffee stall attendant used to push me a hot pie and a cup of bottle every morning about half past one, two o'clock. One night he said to me, why don't you join the army? You get into the band as a boy. Happiest days of my life. Went out on a troop ship to India. A lovely sunshine, my own bed, wonderful food, and football, cricket, swimming. I was in the 10th Royal Hussars, riding horses and learning music, but most important of all, wonderful, <laughs> wonderful mates. Our problem with the band, or with the dancers, because I was in charge of the dancers, was that everybody made a dash for the, uh, for the bar during the interval. And I thought it would be rather nice if we could sort of hold the crowds back, just even for a few minutes. I asked each of the bandsmen, six or seven of them, if they would do a little spot for us. When it came to Norman's turn, he said, I can do mimes. I said, oh, well, let, let's have those. I had become the flyweight champion of the British Army in India. And I used to do shadow boxing with an imaginary opponent then, you know. And I let the imaginary opponent hit me. And all the blokes used to laugh. They called the entertainment officer and to see me. And the entertainment officer came in one day and watched me doing all that. And he said, Wisdom, that is in the concert party. And I was in the concert party. I'm going to have a real go here. When I left the army, war was over. I went to Collins Music Hall in Islington, saw the manager there. He said, what do you want? I said, I'd like to go on a stage. He said, well, don't be silly. The, the variety of theatres are closing all over the country. He said, you don't stand a chance. Forget it. But I, I wouldn't listen to him. I took a room nearby, and I became that man's shadow for three weeks. I mean, if he was in the bar and he lifted a pint of beer to his mouth, my, my arm was under his elbow. Until eventually he said, look, he said, if I let you go on first house on Monday and you're no good, will you promise to go away and leave me alone? And I said, yes, I promise. And I went on first house Monday and it worked. Now don't forget, confidence, deportment, smile at the audience, make an entrance. That's right. Uh. I had a piano on stage, and I got my hand caught in that. My uncle Bernie's agency represented Norman through Billy Marsh, who was one of Bernie's partners. Billy had the greatest eye for comic talent of anybody who's ever breathed in this country or breathed show business. He was responsible for the careers of uh, Norman Wisdom, Morecambe and Wise, Harry Worth, Bruce Forsyth. Norman was his first really great discovery and his association with Norman, his advice, the career moves that he made, moving him from the stage to the cinema and so on, uh, Billy was absolutely instrumental in making the right moves at the right time. Billy booked me summer season at the Spa Theatre Scarborough. I was sharing a dressing room with a conjurer. He said to me, tell you what, Norman, I said, what's it? He said, well, when I invite somebody to come up from the audience to do, help me to do a trick, if it's you, he said, then you come up and we can get some laughs. Ladies and gentlemen, I am going to take this gentleman's watch and I am going to wrap it in a very ordinary piece of paper. Now then, do you know what I'm going to do with your watch? No, sir. I'm going to place it on the table, so. And I'm going to break it up into lots and lots of little pieces. <laughs> there. Now, I suppose you think your watch is all smashed and broken. 